Okay, I'm starting the recording. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first uh, meeting of the Kudjivik community. Uh, I'm Maru. Uh, I'm working at, as a software engineer at AppScoot. I'm working on Kudjivik project for last one year. Uh, so let's get forward. So our meeting will be bi-weekly. It will start from today. Uh, the, the time is the 9 a.m. PST, Pacific Standard Time. The durations will be 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, the Zoom link uh, is per, uh, persistent. The calendar link, uh, people can come here and add that to their calendar. Uh, the doc link is, this is the doc we will uh, we will try to maintain to to see, um, to schedule our meetings um, if it, you can see the meetings will be in, divided into three parts it is uh, intro and demo for 10 minutes and then discussion topic with the users uh, to ed uh, for uh, our procedure will be where people will come here and give a suggestion button and then edit here. And but to edit to, to suggest in this doc, people need to be add in the Google. Uh, it's not working. In the Google group, and that's also given in, in the doc and in here, in this Google forum. People need to be added there so they can edit the doc later. Uh, that's it. Our goal will be to, uh, to, uh, to discuss about the project status and how future improvement can be done and build up a self-healing community. By self-healing, uh, I mean we, we can discuss uh, whatever uh, we, uh, feature we want and then we can implement with the help with uh, one each other. So uh, today I will discuss, I will give a demo of our the present status of KubeDB, uh, what we have got done so far and where we are standing now. Then we will discuss what the progress is going on for uh, in KubeDB project. Uh, sorry for my bad English, the English is my second language, so <laughs> bear with me. So I made a slide, a little slide to describe the status of QB project. Uh, we have done uh, total six databases so far. And the clustering is only available for Elasticsearch and Postgres. Uh, for Elasticsearch, the other things are, are available right now. You can see here in the, uh, in the slide. Um, authentication with the system, persistent volume. We can take instant backup, schedule backup initialization from script, initialization from snapshot, and built-in Prometheus is uh, given support. Built-in means mm, the Prometheus that the core, Prom uh, the basic Prometheus we can say, and the core Prometheus is also given. People uh, need, user need to install a Prometheus operator there and uh, to declare that he wants to uh, create all the stuff for KubeDB itself. And then KubeDB will uh, acknowledge that and create the uh, current initialization from the script is not available, but we will come. Uh, we, it will come shortly. Uh, for Postgres features, we can see what is available. Uh, currently, synchronous replication is not available, but we are hopeful it will be available very soon. Uh, others than other than uh, we have added on another extra thing, G support. This is a um, uh, uh, this is a very cool feature if you, I, if I say. Uh, and clustering is uh, divided into ORM standby and hot standby. Uh, the OZ is actually does what that uh, it um, synchronizes the cluster through a cloud. So it is only available right now for AWS, but we're okay. We, we have planned to uh, make it available for others too. It also comes with instant backup, schedule backup, and other things. For MongoDB, we are working on clustering. 
actually i am working on clustering right now the replica set will be available in couple of two weeks uh, i guess probably uh, other than that uh, persistent volume and other uh, yeah, basic things of kubedb is available for mongodb for mysql uh, the same thing comes here too clustering is not available yet but other than that all the things are in right now user can come and test it but the clustering feature will be will come shortly for Redis, we do uh, we don't give the snapshot and persistent volume feature. So a snapshot, a schedule backup, uh, and then instance with snapshot is not available. But we will uh, probably so clustering will work after a few few days, I guess. Uh, so that will come and it happen. Uh, for main case too, we don't uh, provide persistent volume, instance backup, schedule backup. Uh, but we will work on clustering too here. And that's the six uh, database that we support right now. Uh, our progress will be, we are working on user management. Uh, this is, uh, this is yeah, some, some users have already requested this uh, feature for this feature. Uh, then uh, explore service broker for integration. Uh, then MongoDB clustering and support environment variables. This is already done. This is master to master. Um, uh, probably it will uh, will release it in a couple of days. Uh, then we will work on support custom configuration. It is on progress, and uh, hopefully it will come in uh, shortly too. And then. The links are here given. I will share the slide in in our room, in our QDB room, so people can come and see that they see the that. Uh, our next goal will be to discuss about the uh, introduce uh, how user management thing will be introduced to KubeDB. Uh, uh, we will see that in details in our next uh, meeting uh, and we will discuss how uh, we can uh, uh, we can plan for future of there uh, I guess uh, that's the overall slide uh, it is short but I guess that's the uh, overall status right now so we can discuss some few things uh, right now uh, we have a couple of issues are given here. Uh, so before we go any further, I think uh, I should welcome Jack. Uh, uh, hi, Jack. This is Tamal. I think uh, we talked uh, on the Kubernetes Slack yesterday. Uh, yes, hello. Hey, so the postgres thing. Uh, yeah, so uh, if you would uh, like to introduce uh, yourself and like tell us uh, when, uh, what, what is ex uh, exciting for you about QTB, that would be great. And, uh, and uh, you know, if you have any questions or anything you would like to discuss. Sure, uh, so uh, Jack Shedd, I'm a partner at an agency called Mess here in Chicago in Illinois. Um, I found QDB when I was looking for an easy way to integrate Postgres into our Kubernetes cluster on Google Cloud. It's our, like I'm moving over a whole stack to Kubernetes and it's been a struggle. Um, what uh, I really, the reason I was attracted to it is it was, uh, it supported all the database types and system types, both Redis, Postgres, MySQL we use in our stack. Um, the, files weren't crazy. I didn't have to worry about custom images and it handled uh, snapshotting and backups automatically, which I think was the big thing which attracted me to using QDB over home rolling my own solution. It was just, it was just handled. Um, yeah, I think the only things I've really seen so far in general, the product's great. Uh, the manner, um, I wish there was more flexibility in how snapshotting is done. Um, mm -hmm. the, I mean, I've solved that with scripting on my side, but that's really all I've seen to complain about. Um, yeah. And then like tomorrow you were great jumping on yesterday and helping me get that bug fixed. Like that was amazing. 
Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah my pleasure. So uh, uh, for uh, regarding snapshot, I think uh, is it the issue that uh, I think uh, the, the issue we talked about yesterday, right? That you you're saying that you would like to um, so basically keep the snapshot in Kubernetes. And then, uh, then maybe keep one single sort of object in Kubernetes, but then have um, like uh, effectively diff tell the uh, file name that is used or stored on the bucket in the cloud bucket, so that yeah, like I would imagine. I think for me, the way snapshotting work right now is weird. Like I would expect it to function more like a Kubernetes job, where you know, request the snapshot, you wait for it to be done, and then it's done, and the job's deleted. Um, the way it's implemented right now is strange. Mm -hmm. But the general use case is, you know, before any time we do a release through our CI tools, I want to snapshot the database before we do like uh, we run Django or WordPress migrations. In case something goes wrong, I want to be able to immediately revert. Um, and right now it sucks about the way it's currently set up is I have to, you know, delete the snapshot, which I lose the previous snapshot, which means that if someone is doing multiple releases, you may hit a situation where one developer pushes to a branch the system starts, the snapshot starts, and it fails, and they don't realize it failed, and they, someone else pushes another thing, and the good snapshot that actually would save our ass is lost. Um, I solved it by just now, before I snapshot, I copy the current snapshot into a, another file, but it just feels like the type of thing that should just be handled right by the tooling. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I see what you're saying. Um, I think I, I need to think about this a little bit. Uh, so the way kind of it's been designed right now is that when that snapshot object is created, uh, effectively the kubedb operators uh, notices that, and then it's going to launch a job, the Kubernetes job to take the backup and then store the data. And the way we sort of kind of imagined was uh, sort of this, the snapshot CID is kind of like a, um, effectively your system of record in a way, what's stored in the bucket. So that later, if you want to sort of clean that up, you can effectively delete this one because that snapshot object has all the information needed to actually clean up the data in the, in the bucket uh, because it has the credential information and whatnot. So you can, next time you can effectively use a different credential stored in a different bucket so they could be like a separate things. Um, yeah, maybe there's something else because like the way we're using it, like it, the fact that it actually has credentialing information in, in it yeah. uh, is bothersome. Like I, when I do the PG dump through my own scripting, I'll usually do, you know, uh, the create object option, but then no owner. So it can just be restored into any uh, Postgres database instance. Um, and we have, since we have different passwords across different machines, right, right now I have to script the fact that like, okay, pull the database down and then reset the password because it's not going to be the user's local password. Mm. Uh, so that could also be handled with a way to like specify what options you want run on PG dump um, when the things created have a default, but then give give us away in this in the snapshot spec to say what options I want passed because we would actually maybe have slightly different options. We have some systems where we have very large tables that just contain junk data, and when I snapshot the system, I wouldn't actually want to cat data, um, which we do right now through scripting. So that'd be another like potential feature, I guess. Yeah, I think I think the last thing we kind of discussed internally before was that uh, like you want to specify which tables to take backup, you know, not like uh, PG dump all instead of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean it would be great if you can. Um, you know, uh, I'm not sure if you are able to sort of share the script that you kind of scripted around it. That that would be even better to sort of see exactly. Like how to make this process even uh, sort of, uh, you know, smooth, uh, sort of easy? Sure, it's just a buddy pipeline, but I can um, I can document the commands I'm using. So I'll uh, I'll get that together for you guys and share it in the channel. Okay, yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. So, uh, is there anything else uh, you wanted to discuss? No, you guys are doing great work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the, the team, the, 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 you know, the team is doing great work, uh, and we're, we're trying to see if we can make it easy. Kind of, uh, we started on this project because we ourselves had like quite a bit of trouble like, running databases in Kubernetes, and sort of said, you know, maybe we should do something with that. And uh, 
and I've been, you know, that's where we are so far. Um, so, so I think uh, some of the things that uh, uh, Maruf mentioned was the sort of the some the big items that we are doing. So the way the project sort of is organized now is if you go to the KubeDB uh, GitHub organization. Um, so we have a, uh, I, I try to sort of organize them via levels. So all the issues are in the project uh, GitHub uh, KubeDB project repo. And then there, there are like a bunch of uh, issues that are labeled as ick. So these are effectively like a big items uh, feature request that uh, we have sort of received over the time and are kind of uh, hope to work on. So, so some of the issues that uh, uh, we are kind of actively working on right now, I think one of the big one is the, so effectively two sides of the issue. One is the customization part, uh, custom configuration in various ways. Uh, so one is the, the one that has been already been implemented is uh, passing custom environment variables. Like some people want to sort of customize the various environment variables sent to their uh, database because the Docker images usually help like have a bunch of different options. Like somebody said they wanted to change the root database uh, uh, for Postgres, the database name, things like that. So you'll be able to do that using the using uh, environment variables that you can set in the CRD. Uh, the other thing was uh, I think that has been requested quite a few times is the custom configuration. So usually it sort of like users want to pass some sort of um, uh, file, um, a configuration file, uh, and then mount that into the into, into the database uh, pod. So, so currently, what we are doing is uh, so this is this is the work that has been going on right now. Emrose is working on this. Um, so, this one. Uh, so what they have done is effectively you can mount it either a config map or a secret because sometimes if these configuration files have a secret data like kind of credentials sort of type of information. So you can mount either a config map or a secret. Uh, you can provide that name in the database CRD and then we'll mount that into the state full set for uh, state full set that, that runs and then the, the inter Internally, you will have some sort of effectively include their data, uh, that the configuration information. So, like, uh, so it will automatically apply whatever customization you're trying to do. So, I think this is going on. Uh, so, so, these are the two features we hope to release in the next uh, release that comes out, uh, hopefully, in a few weeks. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, I think we should be able to do it. Uh, and then I think the other big thing, uh, the change or sort of update that we have done is uh, we updated these. So the Kubernetes 111 just came out uh, like uh, in the last week of June. So we have uh, so some some changes are needed in the library, how like the CRDs work in the new version. Uh, so we have uh, updated all the libraries and everything. So that will be another big change. Uh, I mean, it's not a very, much user visible change, but it's like kind of needed because they made like a Kubernetes project itself made a breaking change in the CRDs, the way it works. So the status part is now like a separate resource. Um, it's called like a sub resource in Kubernetes terms. Uh, so so it will be supported. Um, and uh, and also the, uh, the uh, so you know, and uh, the, the other thing that we have been sort of uh, uh, trying to see if we can uh, sort of just make Cube uh, Cuddle, the Cube CTO work with uh, our CRDs as a sort of first class citizen. So, um, so the, the 111, uh, the Kubernetes 111 has some features where like when you do the uh, the cube CTL, like the cube cuddle get like Postgres or any kind of commands, uh, right now, uh, like in the versions 110 or prior versions, you will only see like two columns. You see the Postgres object names and the age, like how effectively it's like a age, like how long it was created. But in the new version, you will be able to sort of customize that view via the, you know, some server side. Uh, uh, configuration uh, on the on the CRDs, 
So that uh, that has been so that that is also going to be supported in the in the next release. So they uh, it's called like a column printing CRD custom resource definition column printing. So we'll be able to sort of specify which columns are shown when the kubectl will get Postgres call is made. Um, so so those are probably are the big items in the next release, and then. Um, and then we are also working on another thing. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, regarding uh, user management. It's um, so this has been a requested feature that uh, like okay, so you run the database, but now we would like to create users for various databases and like you know provision their credentials and all sorts of things. So right now what we are doing is uh, you may be familiar with the project called uh, for, from HashiCorp called Vault. Right, Vault is like a security uh, manager tool, right? And you can effectively provision various types of credentials and store secrets in that. So one of the features of Vault is that Vault can actually do um, database secret management. So you can effectively, uh, you know, configure Vault to say, okay, this is my database root credential, and then now when you need a new user account, you actually ask Vault to give me that user, and then Vault will effectively provision that user with whatever permissions you want and, um, and uh, return that secret information. So that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's our first uh, sort of uh, way we are doing this, but this will be all done in a way sort of somewhat similar to the way the RBAC permissions work in Kubernetes. So effectively you will define a role for a database. The role will effectively say, okay, when a new user is created, this user will have select permission on these tables on this schema and then you create a and then you can bind that uh, role to a user in, like in the kubernetes space so it's a, it could be a it could be a kubernetes user or it could be a kubernetes uh, like a service account and then when you do that the operator will, operator will automatically uh, call vault and issue that uh, create that user effectively create a new secret that secret will have that uh, username and credential so that way you'll be able to dynamically create new users and uh, and the nice thing about vault is uh, which could be a nice thing or could be a problem depending on uh, your usage pattern uh, it is that vault actually does like automatically secret rotation so so the secret that it's so the, even the database uh, secret uh, or the user that it issues, it will have a, like a maximum lifetime. So you can say how many hours or days, and then how, how frequently that secret will be rotated. Uh, so it will do all of that things, which is nice if you like, um, you know, so really sort of paranoid about security, but then it could be a little bit of a problem. You know, usually if your application isn't like aware of this kind of like a rotating security, uh, rotating credentials. Uh, so, um, so, but as a first pass, we're going to go with, going with that. But I think the way the the general uh, the, the 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 role and the role binding objects are defined, it will be possible down the road to actually have an implementation where uh, it's, it's sort of like in a static implementation. So, if there is no vault involved, you 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 know when you create those roles and actually create the bindings will just uh, directly issue a new user which has a static uh, password so you don't have to worry about like updating and uh, like uh, worry about dealing with rotating credentials because dealing with rotating credentials means your application has to know how to effectively it has to read from some file or in some environment variable every time it connects so that it knows that the credential might change on the fly uh, as the application is running uh, so i think uh, i think that's the kind of uh, overall uh, where we are um, and uh, and and I think the other big thing has been sort of uh, just uh, adding clustering support to all the supported databases so so Postgres and Elasticsearch already does support uh, Maruf is working on adding uh, clustering to MongoDB and then the MySQL is the next big one hopefully and then um, and then Redish and Memcache uh, sort of will come down after that so yeah so i think uh, and then uh, as far as uh, database coverage i think we'll would like to finish up all this work first i think that's the channel plan unless 
somebody wants to contribute uh, sort of a new database uh, in the mix to finish up these ones and then um, we can look into maybe adding additional databases um, it's it's you know really up to the users to decide, kind of uh, give us feedback what they would like to see um, yeah i think um, that kind of uh, covers sort of the you know the status of the project and uh, how we are sort of thinking about it so i think we are kind of close to our time for the meeting today but um, so you know give us feedback uh, join our slack channel and uh, you know if you have issues you can talk to us there uh, or file issues in our github uh, project and um, we're looking forward to hear from you guys more and um, you know give us feedback how to make it better and uh, come join contribute uh yeah so i think that's probably all we have today uh anything else Marf? no uh, i'm fine okay okay then thank you everyone uh we'll see you in two weeks Bye. okay i'm ending the meeting now though so.